So welcome all to our community demo. Uh, today we have a pretty packed agenda. So let's start. Unfortunately, today we are not streaming live on YouTube, but it will be available on YouTube uh, later this week. So this is our agenda. We have like 12 presenters, but in the very beginning, we have uh, one announcement. Uh, Foreman 3.7.0 RC2 is out. Uh, there is a community post and uh, about installation and upgrade instructions. We would love to uh, we would love you to test it because it would really provide a real value to our project. There are like two weeks to test this. So go ahead. And we can start uh, with the very first uh, presenter, Yevgeny. Hi, and thank you, Maria. <clears throat> I will be talking today about Packet, at least very briefly. Let me share the screen and steal Maria's focus. Built in display. Perfect. Um, this is a post of mine from a couple of months ago where I started working on Packet. Packet is a, a service that is provided by the Fedora people. And it has two main features. It allows you to build RPMs uh, from essentially any PR on GitHub or GitLab. And it also allows later when a release is done to make um, actions to push those packages into Fedora. Um, given that we do not package directly for Fedora, the second part is not relevant to us. But the first one is very much relevant because this means that we can have RPMs from essentially any PR that somebody is opening with production a compilation of JavaScript and, and Ruby and everything. And it can be just tried out on any random machine that has DNF installed, which is pretty awesome. For example, I have a PR open against Catello, which is right now just um, actually providing packet for Catello. So it's not much yet, but due to the way how packet works, uh, there is a build available. And if we scroll down here, oh, it's a bit longer. You will see like a new status reported uh, in GitHub. And right now it says it's built for a stream eight. Um, in the very same way, you would see stream nine packages whenever we actually go and start building from stream nine and if you care like about details um you can go like on the details of the page and there's a dashboard provided which um on the one hand provides information like how to enable this repository but also has links to um uh, to logs and to copper and it links to copper copper is another service provided by fedora because Packet is it's not building packages itself. It's just a proxy service, so to say. But it it gets data from um, from GitHub and submits then builds to Copper. And this build then exists. You can see logs. Let me scroll scroll in a bit. There's like logs of the build and everything, so you can follow up on stuff if things break. In this particular case, it didn't break. And I have a Catello Nightly machine here. It's not the freshest Nightly, but because like right now Nightlies are broken due to the branching, right? And um, right now I have Ruby Jam Catello something installed from a couple of days ago, 22nd of, uh, of May. And what I can do now is I can say DNF uh, copper enable and then it says packet for the owner of the repository of the copper repository right and then it's like organization 
uh, repository and PR number. So it's pretty easy to template. And due to a bug in DNF, you have to explicitly say that you want to go and have the center stream thing. Because otherwise, if we omit it, ouch, where's my key dot? Um, it will ask you, ah, do we want to? We say, yes, of course we want it. And then you say, oh, but there is no uh, EPEL. But we don't care about EPEL, right? We want CentOS stream directly. And that's also what we are going to enable. So DNF copper enable packet catello catello 10566. Again, it asks us. This time the thing succeeds. And we see it in the repo list. Um, that there is now a, a packet copper available, and we can now go and um, upgrade it, and we would be getting a newer build from the 22nd, uh, 23rd of May. And it contains like other metadata, so you actually can. <clears throat> You can see from the RPM version like where this particular RPM came from. Um, this is like the use side of it. It's pretty pretty nice, pretty easy to consume RPMs. And for example, I used this um, the other day when Adam was working on the whole JavaScript translation uh, stack. Um, he was prototyping everything in the Foreman tasks repository. And tasks already has packet enabled, so I could just go enable the, the packet repository for that PR Adam was working on and just getting the latest uh, production uh, built RPMs and use them for my testing. It was pretty awesome. And for adding, um, we do have a template repository, right? For plugins, uh, and we recently added a packet template, also like a packet file there. So if you're now going to create a new plugin and create it from this template, everything will be set up for you. And the moment the plugin is actually packaged, this is like the important part, the plugin needs to be packaged already uh, for form and packaging. You remove those two lines. <clears throat> So it's actually enabling packet, and everything then is happening um, essentially magically. The, the, the file itself says where to get the spec file, how to obtain the version, how to build the gem, and then it goes and configures our repositories and builds them. The same also exists for smart proxies. Um, smart. Proxy plugin template. Um, it boringly looks absolutely the same. So, um, really just saying a different name. And I think also for Hammer Ansible, we also enabled it. And yeah, please try to go enable it on your repository. It's like, it, then the app needs to be installed on the organization, which it is true for Foreman. If you want to do it like outside the Foreman, you need to follow like a two minute process to enable it um, on the organization. Like as, it's a GitHub app, right? Um, it's done on Catella, it's done on the Foreman. And if you Max want to have it on, on ethics, you need to go and click through, but that's it. And yeah, I hope everybody will use it because it makes testing PRs so much easier. Um, and also it allow allows you to go give those RPMs to somebody who doesn't have a devil set up like support or um, any user that is trying to um, get around the problem. So yeah, that's pretty cool. And if you have questions, problems, come to us and we'll hopefully solve them or yell at packaging, which is what we do or always do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Evgeny. The next one is Carolina, and she will be talking about adding bookmark search button.
Mm -hmm. uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, I'd like to show you just a small fix in the Catello content subscription step. Uh, we use the search bar often and it's also usually used with the bookmarks drop down. So it will be now also available here in the subscriptions and you'll be able to bookmark your searches and manage bookmarks, etc. Yeah, and that's all from me. Thank you. The next one is Adam and Hammer and Time Zones. Hello, hello everyone. I'm Adam and I'll be talking about Hammer and Time Zones. Uh, I'll kick this off with a quote from, from Phil Carlton, who allegedly said that there are only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. And I would probably add time zones to at least like to be there in the top three. Uh, now, with that being said, uh, let's get to the actual thing. Uh, for quite a long time, you know, you could use Hammer to interact with your foreman and uh, Hammer does, has this concept of normalizers and is you pass in a value and the Hammer will kind of parse it and convert it to a different type or something so that it makes sense uh, in, in, in that context. Uh, one of those normalizers is date time normalizer, which, as the name suggests, uh, takes dates and times and kind of tries to parse them. So what I'm talking about will essentially affect every single field which has uh, the date time as a placeholder. So here the option detail says that it's a date and time in this format or ISO 8601. Uh, that is all fine and dandy, but there was a gotcha. And this gotcha was there for quite some time. Uh, if I'm reading my git blame correctly, then it was there since February 2014. So quite some time, yes. Uh, now, what is the actual issue? Uh, my machine right here, it's a virtual machine. I don't really care about time zones in there. So the machine thinks it's in UTC, which is probably fine, I guess. And then when I uh, run something from through Hammer and I pass a date, that date will be considered to be in UTC. I have a little script in here, which will take a date and it will schedule a remote execution job to be executed at that date. It will also take the date and it will convert it to UTC so we get uh, you know, a common point in time that we can reference. So if I, uh, I just run it and it's set to be executed at uh, 19th of June, 2023 at 23 hours, 24 minutes, just before midnight. If I run it, then, you know, my machine is UT in UTC. So convert it to UTC, it's the same time. And if I, uh, if I look at the details, I, I, I'll get the expected result, right? It's the same date, it's UTC, it's fine. However, if let's say the machine is in Phoenix uh, in Arizona, then the time I passed in is this, it's still just yeah. before midnight, but in UTC it's 6.24 in the morning uh, on the next day. So there's quite a gap, right? However, however, this is what it should be. But if I look at the details of the job that was actually triggered, I can see that it was just before midnight in UTC, which is kind of wrong. Uh, it probably would be fine if you 
suspected that, but we never really stated anywhere how it should work. So that was a little bit of a surprise. Of course, you could go ahead and you could put the time zone into the timestamp that you're providing, and that would work. But I have a gut feeling no one really does that, and everyone kind of assumes that the computers would do the right thing. So uh, the thing, uh, how was the branch called? Uh, so the fix actually, sorry, look at that. So what the fix does is that now when you pass in the timestamp, it actually honors the time zone of the machine where you're running Hammer. So in here, again, if I try doing that America Phoenix, uh, still it should be a little bit after six in the morning in UTC. And if I look in the details, I can see that it is hopefully, yes, it is still there. So from starting with Foreman 3.7, Hammer actually honors the EZ environment variable and the time zone of the machine where it is running in. And it, it honors it. There will be no more surprises. This is the way it should work. Of course, what you can do is you can still provide the time zone in the timestamp. And that then, of course, that one will win. So even now that I'm simulating having my machine run in Phoenix, uh, it will, it should run just before midnight. And if we look at the details, we can see, we can see that indeed it is, that Hammer is indeed honoring the time zone information that is provided in, in the timestamp itself. Uh, so this is the thing, this is the fix. Uh, maybe one more thing that I feel like I should point out explicitly and again, is that this affects any, and I can't stress that enough, any field that accepts date times in Hammer which means all your uh, remote executions, all the sync plans and stuff, all those things should be fixed by this and should behave this way. And that's all folks. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Adam, very much. The next one is Jeremy and he will talk about simplifying, enabling and disabling custom repos on a host and much more and much more yes uh so hi everyone i'm jeremy from the catello team you know me uh today i'm here to talk to you about a couple things couple improvements for catello 4.9 uh we have some enhancements around repository sets and also around regenerating repository metadata uh, so please feel free to interrupt me if anyone cannot hear or see things. Um, so first I'll start with repository sets. As I explained in the last demo, Catella 4.9 will have a lot of changes uh, designed to make it easier to work with custom products when you're using simple content access. And as part of that, we have improved two pages in the web UI. First, the repository sets tab on the new host details page, which I am showing you now. Uh, we've added this new dropdown for repository type, and it makes it easier to filter by either Red Hat uh, repositories or custom repositories. Uh, so the main reason we've added this is so that it's easier for you to add content overrides. Uh, as we remember from the last demo, custom products are disabled by default now, uh, but you still have control. You can override that if you want. So with this new filter drop down, it makes it really easy because all you have to do is click the checkbox to select all, and I can override to enabled. If my server is running today.
Yeah, I guess the server is having problems today. But anyway, you can imagine. Makes it pretty easy. Oh, there we go. You can override to enabled, you can override to disabled, and you can reset to default. Oh, now it's waking up. Okay, great. All right, now I've just reset everything to default. And now if I click again here, it goes up, goes back out to the viewer. I can see everything, and we can see that my change has only applied to the uh, custom repositories. Um, we've also added this repository type column uh, so you can easily see which type of repository you have in the table here. Uh, in addition to that, we've also added a similar thing to the activation keys page, uh, activation key details page. Uh, so you see on the repository sets here, uh, you have this drop down, all Red Hat or custom works pretty much the same way as the one I just showed you. And then you can use the actions here like you're used to. Uh, so that is the change for repository sets. I'll pause briefly and see if there's any questions. Doesn't look like there are. OK, so moving on to regenerating repository metadata. So if I have a product, and within that product, uh, I have a repository. There are a few different mirroring policies that I can use. And uh, for some reason, the explanations only show up when you create a new one. So I'm just going to go to the create repository screen here and show you. OK, so we have three mirroring policies. We've got additive, which I believe is the default, which is where new content available during sync will be added to the repository and no content will be removed. Uh, and then we have mirror content only, which is where we both add and remove uh, content based on what's in the upstream repository. And finally, we have mirror complete, which is all of the above, except we also mirror the metadata. Uh, so the change here is it's actually adding something back that was there before, which is uh, republish or regenerate repository metadata. Uh, so when Pulp first added this complete mirroring feature, this was actually removed from the web UI. Uh, why? If you tried to regenerate metadata on a repository that used complete mirroring, you might end up with some sort of incorrect metadata or a mismatch between Catello and upstream metadata. Uh, I'm going to leave it to the Pulp experts to uh, tell you the, the exact ramifications of that, but that's that's what I know. Um, so now we've added it back because it's very popular as a troubleshooting step. And it's a lot easier to do things in the web UI than it is with the uh, API or Hammer. Uh, but there's one caveat here, which is that it will not be available for repositories that use complete mirroring. So if my repository uses complete mirroring, we can see here the option is going to be disabled. Uh, likewise, we've also added this option in the web UI for content view versions. So if I have my content view version details screen here, the option's right here, republish repository metadata. But you can see that since one of the repositories in this content view version uses complete mirroring, is this is uh, disabled. Uh, so for right now, you can still do it via Hammer or the API, just not in the web UI. But this may change soon because we plan to harden the API and backend so that it handles complete mirroring correctly in all situations and doesn't regenerate any metadata locally that it should be mirroring instead. Uh, so that is the republish repository metadata change. And uh, as always, I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Jeremy. It doesn't seem that we have any questions. So next one is Chris, and he will talk also about metadata. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right. Uh, so we there was an, an escalation that came in um, on the community forums a while back. And so what 
the issue was is being able to set a custom metadata expiration on repos for custom products. And so we went ahead and added that. And so let me go ahead and show what that looks like here. So if I create a new repository, and I'll just create this there. And if I do yum, you have a new uh, pop-up that comes here and we can set that to whatever. We can set that to two, five. Um, and if I go down and hit save, ah, here we go. All right, so if I go into my Z repo here, we can see that it's under publishing settings. It used to be at the top here, then Samir, uh, yesterday we had, after some design discussion, we decided to move it back to pu or to publishing settings where it looks, it's it's a lot better in this area. And so from here, you can change it as well. You can see it, uh, you can increment it here in the UI, you can clear it out. Um, uh, that's pretty much it though. But yeah, this is just for custom products though. Okay, thank you very much. Next one is Samir, and he will talk about uh, updated UI for need to publish flag. Okay. Uh, thanks, Maria. Let me share my screen. Uh, so I did want to talk about one field that has been added to repositories uh, to begin with, which is unrelated to the content view needs published, but we have added the ability to ignore tree infos on repository syncs. So we used to have this flag, ignore SRPMs, and now you can ignore both SRPMs and tree info while syncing your repo. So just an update there because Ian is busy at the summit. Okay, and with that, I'll move to my content views demo. So I have a content view here, uh, CV demo. It has no versions yet. So let me just go ahead and publish a new version. So And now I have a version. And so what I wanted to show actually was this needs publish flag. So let me try that. So this content view, uh, CV demo, does not need a publish right now because we just published it and it has no changes. So I'm just recapping some things that I've shown before uh, in previous demos so you can go back and watch those as well. So when we determine that uh, content view does not need a publish, when you go to your publish wizard, you'll see a notice which tells you that the new published version will be the same as the previous version. So if you want, you can choose not to publish unless it's part of your workflow. So in this case, this should help users to stop publishing versions if they don't actually need to. Uh, so let me actually go ahead and make some changes here so one change for example would be let's say we add a filter so let's go ahead and do that let's say i add a bunch of filters here so what this does is tells this content view that the next time you publish all of these filters need to apply so if I go back to my versions page, now you'll see this icon, which tells you that updates are available. So which means if you now go to publish a new version, this uh, the notice that you saw earlier telling you you don't need to publish has gone away. You can publish uh, as you would. So let's go ahead and publish this. So once you have published this version, you'll see version two. This icon denotes that filters were applied to this version. This is another feature that will be in 4.9. So if you publish a version when filters were applied to it, it will tell you uh, on the UI. 
with this icon. But you'll notice you don't see the needs publish icon here because we just published this version. So these were the determinate cases where we can definitely say if a content view needs to be published to bring in new changes or if there are no changes available. In the back end, how we determine that is using audit records. And so let's look at a couple of indeterminate cases. So let's say I go ahead and delete all the audit records. Uh, so let's look at some of the audit records. So we have a bunch here. And let me just go ahead and delete all of them. So I deleted all the audits. Now we have no way of tracking any changes on the content view version that might have occurred before the audits were deleted. In that case, we go ahead and display a disabled needs publish, which tells the user that we couldn't determine whether you need to publish this or not. And in that case, we'll also not discourage the user from actually going and, and publishing it because we have no way of knowing. So that is one change here. Uh, there's also another case where we, uh, where we cannot determine if publish is needed or not, which is if the version, the latest version was published before the 4.9 upgrade in kettle upstream terms. So that is when we add all of these auditings, which we track to determine if publish is needed. So if your latest version on the content view was published before the 4.9 upgrade, we actually have no way of telling you if you need a publish or not. In that case, we will, will not show the notice whether you need to publish or not. You can just go ahead and simply publish. And following 4.9 upgrades, all new, all new versions that are published will keep a track of things, whether they have changed or not. And yeah, that was all I had. Thank you, Samir. Uh, the next one is Maria with her two topics, one about Rex Wizard and one about uh, persisting attributes on OS Select. I was muted. Hello. Um, the first issue was uh, issue in host groups where users wanted to edit a host group and change the operation system. And when they changed it, the media and the partition table fields were deleted, even if they were the same for the other operation system. So now if you go to select a different one, uh, the media and partition table will stay selected. If you go to a different one that doesn't have the same media, it will be deleted. But for here, the partition table is still the same, so it will be kept the same. Um, my other topic is adding two new buttons to the wizard, to the job wizard. Uh, it's run on selected host and skip to review step. Uh, users wanted an easier way to finish working with the wizard. For example, uh, if they had a job that ran and they want to rerun it, they will just click the button for rerunning and to load. And then they don't need to select anything again. They will just click the run on selected hosts, which are the same hosts that the job previously ran on. Um, these buttons are only available when the field, all the required fields are completed and filled. So here we have to select a host before we can continue and we, before we can run the job. And we have to type in a command. Now we can skip to the review step, review uh, everything we entered and run the job. And yeah, that's it. And hopefully it's much easier to run jobs now. Thank you. Thank you. Next one is Maximilian from ATIX. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, today I want to share some 
news and some updates from us. So as you can see, it, I'm showing you a post from the community forum from, I think, yeah, years ago. <laughs> Um, it started with uh, aptatix.de as a way of providing a package subscription manager for Debian and Ubuntu. Um, and it looks or looked and still looks like this. So a web page where you can go to and get the repositories, for example, for Debian 11 or Ubuntu 22. But since we're also uh, interested and in working on um, managing SUSE content. So for example, we work on the SCC manager plugin. Um, then we thought about an evolution or the next step for um, for this portal basically. And I'm yeah here to present this to you today. So it's called oss.atix.de, so open source software. Um, and as you can see, we've added a package subscription manager for Less. So now you can, under this one domain, you can find the package subscription manager for Debian and Ubuntu as it was before. And we've added um, slash 15 SP4, which is the um, latest service pack released by SUSE. And we've added a subscription manager for slash 12 SP5. And we've created a Thread in the community forum as well. So if you have any questions or if it's maybe temporarily not working for you, uh, please um, post in there or please, uh, yeah, let, let us know. And if my demo gods are with me, we can also just um, test it out quickly. So I'm going to run a, a container with uh, OpenSUSE Leap 15.4. And then I'm going to basically run this uh, long command to um, install, to like get the repository, install the um, uh, GPG key because the packages are signed, um, and then install subscription manager. And it's probably going to take a little while. So I'm just going to jump to my uh, other tab. Uh, you can see I'm also in a container um, running um, OpenSUSE. 15.4, um, and yeah, this is basically the same exact co exact command. Uh, and as you can see, running subscription manager works. It's installed from oss.atix.de. Yeah, um, that's all I wanted to share today. And yeah, give it a try, please, and let us know if it works for you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Our last topic is from. Yurija, and she will be talking about uh, updates in the fact table. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, so I'm Yurija, and I'll be talking about removing the socket chart from uh, from the column in the facts table. So basically, it all started with a bug being reported that it isn't being rendered correctly. And uh, we took a poll. Uh, let me just share my screen. So we took a poll uh, in the community. Uh, we added the post. And as you can see, that the bug, uh, the chart was rendered incompletely. And uh, yeah, so after the poll, it suggested that we should remove the chart. The vote suggested that we should remove the chart because of lack of feedback uh, on the chart. And also, it is uh, not reliably, it's not really reliable. So it is a nice to have feature, uh, but uh, it might not work reliably as expected. Um, so looking into the code. Um, I noticed that the view chart button was the only uh, thing in the actions column. So uh, the chart is kind of broken and it doesn't make sense. So um, what we did is we removed this entire column and this is how it looks like now. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to log in again. Yeah, and this is how it um, looks like now. So. Yeah, it is a removal of the feature. And please let me know if you have any questions or feedback regarding this. Thank you. OK, thank you very, very much. This was our last topic. So 
let me just remind you our next demo is on June 15th. And also keep in mind, we would love your help to uh, test our Foreman 3.7.0 RC2. You can find everything you need in our community post. So thank you very much and have a great day.